っと。<笑><笑> okay. okay, I think I think people are joining us. Good. Um, we're so excited to see all these people. We had a, a our session last night went a little bit over time. So I <laughs> promise you today, Dr. Trish, we're gonna we're gonna keep it to one hour because we know how busy you are. We promise. Oh, Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Not that I don't have another meeting afterwards, but you know, I've been known to run over from one meeting to another. So if we run over a little bit, it won't be the end of the world. You know what? It's hard when you start talking about traveling. You just kind of get carried away, and you're just so you know. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's like you just want to learn more. So. <clears throat> yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, um, okay. Well, why don't we go ahead? We still got people coming in, but I I don't want to miss one moment of our precious time with sure. with Dr. Trish here. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, so thank you all for joining us today. I'm Wendy Perrin. And um, you know, when it comes to COVID, we each have a different level of risk tolerance. Mm -hmm. And we also have very different risk perception. And I think that one of the most challenging things in dealing with this virus as a traveler has been the inability to assess our risk. Um, and our guest today is going to help us do just that. <laughs> you know, help us assess our risk when we consider where and when and how to travel um, during this pandemic. He'll tell us what we need to worry about and what we don't need to worry about. Um, and, and speaking of risk and worry and, and trying to reduce them, I just wanna take one moment to thank our sponsor for Wow Week, which is MedJet. MedJet is a, an, a, a, an emergency assistance membership program uh, that provides air medical transport and also crisis response. And uh, I've been a MedJet my whole family has been MedJet members for years, and it just gives us great peace of mind during COVID. So um, I just want to thank them. And now I also want to introduce uh, the team here. We've got Billy Cohen, who is our Director of Digital Strategy and Content Director. Billy, do you want to say a quick hello? Hey, everyone. It's great to, to have you here again. Thank you so much for coming. I just wanted to um, tell everyone just so you know where to find uh, information on our site. So throughout the pandemic, we've been covering the questions and concerns that readers have been asking us most about. We've collected all of that into um, our COVID-19 section, which you can find on our website, on every page of the website in the black navigation bar at the top, which says COVID-19. Um, and in that section, you'll find articles like how to get a quick COVID test for travel, and um, our constantly updated list of countries that are open to US travelers and what you'll find there. Um, we also have interviews with wow list trip planners who live in other countries and can tell us what it's really like on the ground there. And we have interviews with travelers who've taken trips during the pandemic, plus their post-trip reviews, describing what the trips were really like and how the wow list planners performed and helped them. Um, I'm going to be dropping links in the chat box as things come up tonight that might be useful to you and we'll email out links after the talk as well if you have any, um, if you need, so don't worry if you don't, if you miss something in the chat box. Billy, thank you. Um, and I also just want to introduce Brooke, who many of you know very well because she is the person answering your travel questions all day long. She's um, our, our resident expert on how to get COVID tests and, and everything else you need to know. Brooke, would you like to say a quick hello? Sure. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, as Wendy said, we've been hearing from so many travelers um, lately looking for personalized advice about traveling during COVID. Maybe like me, they're vaccinated, but their children are not, and they want to go somewhere together as safely as possible. They want to go to Europe, and they don't know which country will have the lowest risk. Um, or maybe they're looking for an African safari and they aren't sure which country is safest and whether they should go now or wait another year. Um, so those are the kind of, kinds of questions we're happy to, to help you answer and puzzle out. Um, you can send those questions to us um, via Ask Wendy, which is also in that black navigation bar on our website. And just um, a little bit of housekeeping for this evening. Um, we've had a lot of questions that people submitted um, ahead of time, but feel free to add others to the Q&A box and we'll try to get to as many as we can tonight live. Thank you, Brooke. And now let me introduce, I am so thrilled to introduce Dr. Timothy Trish, who is joining us from Los Angeles. Dr. Trish is a professor of pathology at the University of Southern California's Keck School of Medicine. 
He's the co-director for the Children's Hospital Los Angeles Center for Personalized Medicine program. And before that, he was chief of its Department of Pathology and Laboratory Medicine. He is also, unlike some of the talking heads we see on the news, he is an experienced world traveler. And we love that because often they have a slightly different perspective on everything. Uh, the more you've been around the world, the more you kind of know what's going on out there. And so um, he's been working on coronavirus solutions throughout the pandemic. He was responsible for developing the DNA sequencing based COVID testing program at Children's Hospital, um, USC Keck School of Medicine. And he's also actively engaged in vaccine development efforts designed for use in places like Africa that lack ready access to health care. So Dr. Trish, thank you so much for joining us. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, you know, I'll just, would you like to say something before we dive in? No, just, uh, first of all, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm looking forward to answering your questions. And uh, as you say, yes, I do, I do indeed uh, enjoy traveling. And for those of you on the line, you might be interested in knowing that I sent two pictures of leopards out earlier today for Wendy and another colleague, Sherry, to vote to which one to go with. And so we will be making a very large print of the one that they chose. So the, her, your advice, not only on travel, but also photography is much appreciated. <laughs> well, well, Dr. Trish is an avid photographer who, I mean, like for all those safaris, you know, taking photo, amazing animal <laughs> photographs. So um, in any case, so Dr. Trish, you know, as a traveler, I think what a lot of people want to know is if I'm vaccinated, what should I be worried about? And what do I really not need to worry about? Can you tell us? <laughs> <laughs> sure, I can do my best. Let's start with a simple statistic. Um, people quote the fact that, quote, the vaccine is 95% effective. But let's be dig a little deeper. The, what's your chance of actually developing COVID after vaccination? Uh, and this means that you could potentially have a very low level infection and not even know about it. So the chance of you actually developing the disease and transmitting it to somebody else is approximately one chance in 10,000, okay? So there is extraordinarily low probability that you would ever die of this disease after, well, you would die from this disease or even have the severe form of the disease if you've been vaccinated and you are still fully immune. We'll get to the issue of how long your immunity lasts later, but in this uh, phase that we're in now, everybody who's been vaccinated is effectively immune. With rare exceptions, people who are immune deficient, you've had cancer therapy or something, you know, that's a different ballgame. But for all reasonable, you know, uh, scenarios where you're traveling in the first place, you are unlikely to encounter any difficulty any place you go in the world. The only caveat I would say to all of that is a prudent person will always be sensible. I mean, I think I quoted you earlier, Wendy, that, you know, for example, living in a home with a COVID patient pouring out tons of virus every minute of every day for three or four weeks is probably not a prudent thing you would want to do if you could avoid it because your immune system has limits. But up to any reasonable level, I don't think you have much to worry about and most of the precautions don't apply to you. Well, so, you know, a lot of people are worried about traveling to a place where there is a variant right now. It's like, oh my gosh, there's a new variant over there. I better avoid that entire continent. Like, what can you tell us about variants and, and what we need to watch out for there? Sure. So the first thing to be aware of is that, yeah, there are variants everywhere. A, a little sidelight that if you look at any person's isolate of virus, uh, on average, we probably find 30 or 40, quote, variants or mutations. So people keep talking about variants and they're confusing two things. There's a, a lineage, in other words, something that spreads from person A to B to C, and that is often called a variant. That doesn't mean nearly as much as the particular constellation of mutations in that variant. And unfortunately, the variants pick up new mutations over time, and they still call it the same variant. But a classic example is the UK variant. Originally, that was said to be, oh, that's such a terrible problem. It wasn't such a terrible problem. It wasn't great, but it was, you know, a little more infectious and it was a, you know, not very pleasant variant. What's happened recently in Bristol and now spreading throughout the UK is a new mutation on top of the UK variant. And that mutation is something called E484 
K, shows up in South Africa, Brazil, we've seen it in the United States, and that variant, excuse me, that mutation when added to those variants or, or strains, if you will, causes real problems. It was directly associated with the outbreak in South Africa. It's the reason that Brazil is in such a terrible situation right now. And frankly, it's also true of the, in UK, excuse me, in India, where India, the local strain has now picked up that same mutation. And the reason this happens is that it's like roulette. It's like going to Las Vegas. You keep, every time that virus you know, makes a copy of itself, there's a chance it will pick up one of these mutations. If it makes it work better from the virus's viewpoint, it's gonna become common in that population. And so unfortunately, you know, these variants are, are gonna happen around the world over and over as long as this pandemic goes on. All that really matters is, does it make a difference for your immunity? And the answer is it diminishes your immunity when you encounter one of these bad ones like the E484K, but it doesn't make you non-immune. It means, let's just pretend that it took 10 million viruses to infect you if you were Im immune with a normal strain, okay? Well, let's say it might only be a million copies to infect you with a nasty variant. You're still amazingly immune, okay? I mean, the chances of you getting gazillions of virus particles in your exposure is quite low. So unless you're in extraordinary circumstances, you're gonna be immune to all the variants in the world right now. Well, so what about, um, you know, some people worry about traveling to a place where the local population is not vaccinated mm -hmm. because you could spread the virus to them. Is that likely that you could spread the virus if you're vaccinated? Extremely unlikely. Uh, just a couple of simple little numbers. You know, it's said that it takes at least a million copies of the virus to even begin to cause an infection. The PCR tests pick up copies down to about a thousand. We're now seeing that the average isolate that we analyze is down around a thousand copies or below. That's not enough to cause an infection because most of the people we're testing these days are vaccinated and we get occasional positives even in vaccinated people, but at such low levels, we don't believe that there's any chance that they're gonna infect anybody. The only exceptions, as I said, I mean, I'm in the children's hospital where we have a cancer ward, for example. We unfortunately have a patient who's what we call a long hauler. He's had chemotherapy, he continues to test positive and he, his virus levels are you know, above the level where you could be infectious. So he, for example, would be the sort of person that could transmit the virus to another person. But look at that, this is an extraordinary circumstance. First of all, he's in the hospital because he's being treated for cancer, so he's not going anyplace. So, you know, under normal circumstances with, you know, a person in normal health, the chances of you transmitting the virus to another person is extraordinarily low. Dr. Trish, I have a question about those long haulers. Um, I've read that many of those individuals did not have a serious case, were not necessarily hospitalized with their initial infection, but now are displaying long-term organ issues and such. Yes. Um, have we seen that with any of the breakthrough cases of vaccinated individuals? I have not, no, uh, there've been so few, but it is true that you know, we're seeing, this is a whole nother topic that I shouldn't spend too much time on today since I know there are a lot of questions, but the real problem with this virus is that um, whether you're a long hauler or not, uh, you know, it affects many, many tissues in your body and you can appear to be perfectly healthy, okay? And yet it can still isolate virus from various tissues in your body. This goes on and on and on. And it causes a, a, a multiple you know, syndrome like stroke you've heard about, you've heard you know, all sorts of you know, vascular problems. This is due to the long-term persistence of the virus at very low levels in some patients. Um, they don't necessarily taste, test positive with you know, a swab from the mouth or the nose, but their body still harbors the virus. And uh, this is one of, the, one of the things I think we're all concerned about, whether you're a, a classic long hauler or not, many, many COVID uh, patients, even after they have recovered, still harbor the virus, but it appears not to be infectious because it's buried someplace like in their brain or in a kidney or someplace. And so, you know, it's not infectious, but that's the real problem with the long haulers is the consequences to them for their long-term health. <clears throat> so, so um, back to the, the variants in places around the world, I'm trying to figure out like, are there, are there any countries that we should avoid because <laughs> of the variant? 
I mean, how comfortable can we be that current vaccines are going to protect you from those mm -hmm. variants out there? Okay, so can I turn that around into two answers? First of all, the second answer is I wouldn't worry so much about the variants because remember, you're immune against all the variants if you've been vaccinated. It's just the level of your immunity. Let's just say that you had choices of five plus, four plus, three plus, two plus, and one plus immunity. Your immunity for the, the benign variants, shall we call them, is five plus. Your immunity for the nastiest variants might be three plus. It takes one plus to be immune. So you see, so you're covered. It's just that the coverage is less assured, less guaranteed for some of the nasty variants. What worries me most though, is going into an area with a high prevalence of the variant virus. Remember I said earlier, that there's no such thing as an absolute guarantee of immunity for anybody at any time, okay? Because it is possible to overwhelm your immune system. I mean, you drink a quart of, of viral you know, isolates and uh, you're probably gonna get the disease regardless of how immune you are because you're gonna overwhelm your immune system. So what worries me is going into an area where the virus is endemic everywhere you turn and you're getting exposed to it over and over again, I fear that there's a chance that you're simply gonna overwhelm your immunity. And so I worry less about variants than I do about the local prevalence of the disease. So back to your first question, Personally, I would not be traveling to Brazil or India just right now. <laughs> uh, South Africa has improved dramatically, <clears throat> but you know the areas- Wait, that Have in, they almost reached herd immunity now in South Africa? That's what it looks like, yeah. Because the rate of decline in South Africa now is extraordinary and unprecedented. I would never have dreamed this would happen. And there's really only one explanation. It's not suddenly that everybody got vaccinated. It's because they got vaccinated and also there's so many people got the virus. I mean, it was rampant, as you know, in, South, in the in Cape Town area and then eventually throughout South Africa, it just tore through the population. And now it's in a precipitous decline, which is what you see when you reach herd immunity. So it sure looks like they are, yes. Now, as for India, um, you say that the problem in India was really caused not by the viral strains or mutations, but by human behavior. I mean, it's yes. really all about, in the end, it's really all about human behavior is what I've been hearing from you. Yeah, absolutely. And, I, and to be fair, I would say it's like 95% human behavior and 5% strain. The reason the strain is relevant, because if one version of the virus is more transmissible than the other, that would mean nothing you know, until you probably pack them into some sort of religious festival with 100,000 people standing next to one another. Guess what happens with the more transmissible variant? More people will get sick and it'll spread through the population more su successfully and efficiently. So, but if the crowd never occurred in the first place, the virus has no place to go. So the combination of a more transmissible virus and a lot of people hanging around together you know, is a real bad combination. And that's what happened in India. They had a bunch of religious festivals and political gatherings. And of course, then it went absolutely exponential. So you want to avoid masses of people. That's for but, sure. But, but are airports, do you consider airports masses of people? Not like what we saw in India or in Brazil or South Africa. <clears throat> uh, there are masses of people, but there presumably there's so many safeguards. And one of the reasons I think things are going so well in South Africa now is that now they have many, many safeguards in place. You know, you get tested at the airport for positivity. You get tested for symptoms. Everybody arriving gets tested. Everybody leaving gets tested. When you put those type of measures in place, you limit the possibility of spread. And, and let's be honest, most of the pandemic has been driven by so-called super spreader events. So what you don't want is, you know, the classic story I mentioned to you earlier today of the so-called typhoid Mary, the person who doesn't know that they are in fact about to come down with it. But in the meantime, they go sit down and have dinner with 100,000 people. Guess what happens? 100,000 people now get you know the virus, which is how this all started, by the way, in New England at a big uh, biotech conference where almost everybody at the conference ended up getting the virus. So you know, an airport's not like that. It's transient exposure and many people have been cleared. So the probability of there being a problem in a place like an airport is minuscule compared to like a religious festival or a political rally. Dr. Trish, you mentioned the tests that are required for, for many um, destinations these days. And you, you said earlier that uh, PCR tests are extremely uh, sensitive and, yes. and measure a, a viral load that's lower than would 
uh, give you symptoms. Yes. So we have one um, listener who asked, what if we test positive on a pre-travel test, even if the count is so low as not to pass it on to others, that could ca cause a lot of problems traveling. You know, what if you're trying to get home to the US and your test comes back positive? Yeah, this is a real big problem. And I will be honest with you, none of us, at least I don't, know what yet to do about the PCR positive people running down around a thousand copies. Uh, you know, we, we use a, this, I'm sorry if I digress for a second, but bear with me. We, uh, we do a screen with PCR positive, And then when we get a positive on the PCR, we do something called full length viral sequencing. This virus is 30,000 bases long, you know, in terms of if it were DNA, you would call it 30,000, you know, GACTs or whatever. Uh, the interesting thing is when we have high viral titers, we can sequence the whole thing end to end, okay? Which is how we look for the mutation. For what we're seeing now, we can't sequence the whole thing. There's, it's not there. We simply can't find the whole length of the virus. And that leads to a very interesting question. Does that mean that it's just viral fragments and they mean nothing and they can't infect anybody? Or does it mean that our technology is not good enough to pick up all of the pieces at that low level? And honestly, we don't know today, but I don't see any evidence that the very low viral titer people are infectious because we're not seeing it, first of all. And secondly, it's below the threshold of normal infectivity. But the honest truth is you mentioned somebody had a PCR positive test. Oh, but I, I'm a very low copy number. All they're gonna hear is your PCR positive for the virus. And that's probably gonna limit your travel plans. <laughs> okay. Well, so speaking of travel plans or trying to make them, you know, a lot of us are looking at the CDC's advice and it's very, very confusing yeah. um, because they've said, first they said, you know, you can travel at very low risk to yourself, but then they're also saying basically 80% of the countries around the world, we shouldn't be traveling to. Okay. And, but let me just, so let me just, Here's how I'm confused. Like, let's say, uh, you know, New York City, mm -hmm. in the middle of May, they're going to be opening up at full capacity, all the restaurants, <clears throat> museums, theaters, amusement parks. Let's say you decide to fly from Los Angeles to New York on vacation, mm -hmm. and you're going to the theaters and the museums. Apparently, that's safe. Mm -hmm. But if I fly to Costa Rica, which is a shorter flight than mm -hmm. LA to New York. Yeah. I go to Costa Rica, I'm in an isolated bungalow on the beach. I'm outdoors, surfing, fishing, yeah. hiking, yeah. climbing waterfalls. Right. Uh, how is it that your trip to New York, why is it that the CDC is saying that your trip to New York is less safe than my, is more safe than my trip to Costa Rica? <laughs> I don't think it is. Um, if you ask me, would I be willing to go to New York? Yes. If you ask me, would I be willing to go to Costa Rica? Yes. Because in my opinion, unless there were evidence that Costa Rica is in the middle of a huge uptick in the incidence of the virus and or it has high prevalence there right now, which I'm not aware that it is, then I think that is perhaps being overly cautious. The, you know, the issue is it's in reasonable proximity to Brazil. And we know that there is a huge, huge pandemic underway in Brazil. And it's almost certainly spills out into countries you know, near it. Um, but Costa Rica, as far as I know, has not yet had that problem. So if in fact, the data say that there's a relatively low incidence of the virus in a destination that you're interested in going to, I would argue that it's no more dangerous than going to Michigan or Wisconsin, for example. And yet we're all free to go to Michigan and Wisconsin. Have you looked at the numbers there recently? I think I'd worry more about Michigan than Costa Rica, personally. <laughs> Dr. Trish, there's some um, questions coming in about finding um, reliable data. Some, some people are wondering to what degree can we rely on the numbers being reported by other countries? Are there um, useful sources or, or reliable sources for, for the, that data? Yeah. Number one on the list is the CDC itself. You know, the CDC puts out daily you know, tallies of around the world of the reported incidents, and that is probably the most up-to-the-minute data available. <clears throat> Johns Hopkins does a similar thing, and there are multiple other feeds around the world as well. So there is a, a vast network uh, in place already for collecting this data and disseminating it through multiple channels. 
uh, any one of the governmental agencies, at least in the West, <laughs> is, uh, I think, a very reliable source of that information. Yes, we do believe that certain countries <laughs> that, you know, that maybe are not quite um, on top of the numbers, India is almost certainly grossly underreported, by the way. Mm -hmm. China probably is not necessarily so transparent, for example. So there are, you know, some exceptions to the rule. But if you choose a source such as any, in any of the reliable sources, federal and state level sources, public health agencies in the United States, the EU, uh, EU UK, you know, any of these countries, uh, I would believe the data. Where it becomes iffy is when they have other reasons to either not be as open about the data, you know, like China, or when they simply don't have the infrastructure like South America, those numbers are probably not as reliable. So even when they feed into a reliable source, we don't know for a fact that they're absolutely accurate and no one over reports. <laughs> so the only problem is when, <clears throat> you know, it comes from a country that lacks infrastructure, you can probably assume that that's a minimum and the numbers are probably a lot worse. So, you know, if you, if you know there's an epidemic, excuse me, an uptick in the uh, pandemic in a country that with, shall we say, less than reliable uh, numbers reporting, you can probably bet it's even worse than you've been told. But, you know, the again, that's a feed coming from a reliable source like a public health service agency. <clears throat> Um, one of those, you know, agencies and sources that we listen to, a lot of people listen to is the State Department, yes. and they recently changed their criteria to take into account more what the CDC is saying, and that's when they put 80% of the world's countries, they raise them to level four, do mm -hmm. not travel. But, you know, again, it's really confusing because places that previously were considered very safe, like Canada or Switzerland, are suddenly yeah. in the same high-risk bucket as Brazil and India. Yeah. And, and places, and I mean, according to, to the CDC travel health notices, they consider Morocco and China to be safer than <laughs> Canada or Bermuda, right? So no wonder everyone's really confused. And that's why, you know, one viewer is asking, how much weight do you give to the State Department travel advisories and the CDC travel health notices? I give much more credence to the CDC health uh, information. Uh, that's firsthand data. The State Department is then filtering that data and deciding what the relative risk is in their opinion. You know, if you want to make your own uh, decision about the risk you're willing to tolerate or not, I would start, start with the raw numbers as reported by the CDC. <clears throat> and you know, for, to your example of you know, like Canada, yeah, Canada is going through a really bad time right now. And, Personally, I'm very suspicious that the problems we're seeing up in Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Michigan are a spillover effect, you know, because uh, Canada, you know, it just got out of control for reasons I don't understand. But in contrast, um, you know, you have countries where it seems to be burning itself out, like South Africa, and other areas that, you know, seemingly have been like Korea and Singapore, for heaven's sakes, you know. Um, but then you have Japan, which can't seem to get on top of it. It goes down, it goes back up again. So the problem is that if, if you can look at the historical data and the CDC data, typically you can look at charts to see what happened last month, what's going on now, and kind of predict what's where things are headed next month. To me, that's what the information that I would use when I'm trying to make a travel decision because I want to try to anticipate where things are going. I would love to go to a country where it's in precipitous decline. <laughs> I would not be so happy to go to a country where it's in, even if they started with five cases and now they have 500 in a matter of a week, that's kind of a place I'd worry about before I booked my travel, you see? Got it, got it. Well, another thing that people are worried about is the plane, the airplane flight. And a lot of people think to themselves the length of the flight is a really big factor. Like, okay, I'm willing to fly for four hours, but not mm -hmm. for 10 hours. Mm -hmm. Is that, are they right? Like, what are the important things to consider about the airplane flight to make sure you're as mm -hmm. low, you know, you're minimizing your risk? If you wanted to be a statistician, you could argue, quote, that they're right. But that's like, like saying, well, you know, the longer I live on this planet, the greater my probability of getting hit by an asteroid. We don't spend a lot of time worried about getting hit by an asteroid, do we? So I think, you know, uh, yes, a longer airplane flight is by definition, statistically speaking, greater risk. But if the risk is so minuscule, I mean, think about everything you do in life. You go out and get in your car and you pull out of the driveway, you are taking a defined risk. If you pull out of your driveway twice, you're doubling your risk. 
do you not drive because of that? No, you drive despite it, right? Because you know your perception of risk for driving your car is very low, but statistically speaking, it's probably worse than getting on an airplane and taking a four hour or an eight hour or a 10 hour flight. So, I mean, people get killed in cars every day. Not that many people have developed COVID from air travel. It's relatively speaking, relatively safe. There have been some exceptions and that's what worries everybody. Uh, but you know, the exceptions are not the rule. I, well, personally, what I would worry about much more is the off chance that the guy sitting next to you in the middle seat where they're not supposed to be, presumably, uh, is a COVID carrier, doesn't know it, is breathing all over me for the entire flight. Well, in that case, the fact that I'm wearing my mask, except when I'm eating or drinking, ought to provide adequate protection. And the difference between a four hour flight and a 10 hour flight is probably minuscule as opposed to not wearing your face mask where, you know, it could be a, a minor factor. But again, I emphasize the odds are very, very low because the airlines have obviously gone to extraordinary length to clean up the air in the airplanes. It's far cleaner now than it was pre COVID by the way. So you, you sound pretty comfortable with air travel. Someone wants to know when and where is your next international trip? Well, it's interesting. Uh, I think someone asked this question about children. My problem right now is, uh, our, our plan trip included a young uh, grandchild who's not vaccinated. So we are in a bit of a bind right now because I really don't want to take her on an international trip until she gets vaccinated, which as of the guidelines, what yesterday looks like that's going to happen anytime now. So, you know, uh, so that makes me feel a lot better uh, for myself personally. I uh, would not be averse to traveling anytime soon. Um, again, with all the caveats we said earlier, I'm not going to India or Brazil. And until I know a little bit more about the on the ground situation in South Africa, I mean, the numbers are falling precipitously, but I would certainly not want to accidentally land in a hotspot that I didn't know about, obviously. But, you know, certainly from what, everything I'm hearing and what I'm reading is even that's, uh, you know, fair game. And certainly once you get out of the cities, uh, which would be true of most of Africa, obviously, you're in a situation where, particularly like in the lodges and so forth, where from what I understand, all the staff is being tested, you know, everybody that works there, that's an extremely safe environment. So in situations where you know your destination is being tested and people are, you know, unlikely to be you know, spewing virus all over the, your dinner plate or whatever, uh, I would feel very comfortable because the airplane travel is I think far less risky than being exposed to, you know, frankly, but that say that little Jeep ride from the airport to your tent someplace on the Savare with, you know, not Jeep ride, but, you know, like with a, a mini bus with a whole bunch of people in it. And you're wondering, I wonder if everybody in this bus has been vaccinated and if anybody's a carrier, you know, those are the scenarios that I would worry more about. I don't want to be in closed, you know, environment that's not controlled as opposed to an airplane, for example, for prolonged periods of time when I don't know the status of the other people in the vehicle with me. Same reason we're not eating inside in restaurants right now, because this virus is spread from person to person and the only efficient mode of transmission is in a closed environment. If you're outside, not gonna happen. You know, surface contamination, extraordinarily unlikely. Stay inside in a room with a few people, one of whom is spewing out the virus, you got a problem. You mentioned your, your grandchild not yet being vaccinated. Um, a lot of people here are curious about, um, would love to hear more from you ab ab about traveling with a mixed group of vaccinated and unvaccinated, what you feel would be oh. things obviously safe, but, but the safer choices to make. Boy, that is the toughest question that I saw on the list that were sent to me because boy, that strikes home because you know, I'm, I'm working at Children's Hospital. We get the MISs, and that's not uh, MSI, I mean, multi system inflammatory disease. You know, those, those are the sad ones because they're not supposed to get COVID in the first place. And, you know, when they come down with it, it's an absolute disaster. Um, and you think, boy, this could have been avoided if they hadn't been infected. Now, again, the incidence of that is extraordinarily low. I mean, children are very, very unlikely to develop serious disease, but it's not zero. So what's the ethical thing to do? You, know, you take a child not vaccinated, knowing that there's a very low incidence and then how are you gonna feel when in fact they come down with you know, the disease and or serious complications? What's the chance that, that would happen? Extremely low. But if it happens to you, you're gonna feel very, very bad. That's a really, really tough choice. And, and worse about it is that you can make a decision about what's tolerable risk for you. 
but how can you make that decision for a child? <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm in that position myself. I have a nine-year-old, so it's something I'm struggling with too. Oh, believe me, and so do I. So I think, you know, what I've done is we've just delayed travel until my granddaughter, who's what, 12, 13 now, gets vaccinated. Because mm -hmm. um, I just don't personally want to impose that type of risk on our granddaughter. Mm -hmm. It's a tough one. I, I don't really have a good answer, I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, there are some really uh, interesting questions about vaccines. People are wanting to know, for instance, will booster vaccines be required six to 12 months after your vaccination? There's a lot of speculation about that, but the truth is today, no one knows because too few people are more than six months out. But the people who got vaccinated back in the clinical trials are showing the predictable decline in their antibody levels you know, with the amount of um, immune antibodies floating around in your bloodstream are falling because they always do six months or so after you've been exposed to something. That's just natural. But, you know, people, um, I'm going to try not to turn this into an immunology lecture, but, you know, let me just point out that the original SARS patients, what, 17, 18 years ago, are still immune to SARS and they don't have detectable antibodies. How does that happen? Because Fortunately, our immune system is extraordinarily sophisticated and complex, and there's two major arms. There's the arm that makes all those antibodies, but that's really like a temporary response. That's like sending out the troops and you're no longer uh, engaged. Okay, you can let them go, and they go away. Okay, there's the other part that has a very long memory. That's the so-called T-cell or cellular immune arm of your immune system, and that's like forever. Now, T cells are more than adequate to prevent viral infection if you have them. And that's the big question now, isn't it? Did we all develop T cell based immunity as a result of our vaccinations? And I don't know that anybody knows for sure. We certainly have T memory cells. Whether they're enough to provide immunity is an open question. We're all going to find out in the coming months and the, and the best evidence will come from those people who are on the clinical trials. If those people start showing reinfections over the coming months, I don't think realistically it's going to happen in less than a year. But, you know, typically if like a year from now, there are a significant uptick in infections among people who are on the original trials, because that'll be about a year out, you know, by the end of this year, I would say booster shots are going to be inevitable. The one thing that everyone's talking about is the need to do booster shots for against the variants. That is not true yet. I mean, we have not yet seen a variant that absolutely escapes at least three of the major vac vaccines that are out there. So, you know, until that happens, there's no uh, really compelling argument to actually get a booster of a different vaccine against the variant. And I think that's the big open question is, remember I said that your relative immunity could be like a five plus versus a three plus? Well, does that mean that, you know, six months, nine months, a year from now, a nasty variant comes along, you might be immune against the original version, but no longer immune against the variant. That's probably the more realistic concern. And if that happens, then we're going to need booster shots that include protection against the variants. And as you probably have heard in the news, you know, BioNTech, which is the company that you know, actually originated the Pfizer vaccine and Moderna have already created versions of the vaccine, you know, small lots that will be perfectly, absolutely productive. They, they predict against the variants, but no one's putting them into large scale production yet because there's no compelling evidence that you have to do that. But they actually exist. Like if necessary, the yes. vaccines that protect against all the variants. Every yeah, well, I should say against all the known variants. <laughs> yeah, because remember, this is like roulette. You can keep flipping the coin and come up with something different. But the evidence so far is that there's a term that I think is kind of interesting. It's called convergent evolution. So this, this virus e evolves every minute of every day, okay? But notice that it's not going all over the place. It's converging in India, in Brazil, in South Africa, in the UK, even in the United States, even now in Canada, with a certain set of mutations that seem to make it more biologically fit. Because remember, as more and more people get vaccinated, the only form of the virus that's going to survive is one that's more biologically fit, right? It's Darwinian. So the, the, the variants that are more biologically fit are few and far between. So it's not like we're going to see a thousand different variants. So far, I've seen, I, I've lost track of the number now. Let's, I'm pulling a number out of thin air. I have not seen more than 20 variants in total running around the world of any consequence. 
the all the rest of it's noise. So there are 20 give or take variants, you know, mutations, I should say, that seem to keep popping up around the world. If you had vaccines that were effective against that handful of mutations, you almost certainly will have, you know, a vaccine protective against all. We have a number of people in the audience who got um, vaccinated early in the rollout, say February, um, and are now and have fall trips in the works or maybe already planned, maybe trips from 2020 that they had to postpone. Um, they, they're asking, are, are they safe to go six months out from, from and maybe before a booster has, has hit the, the ground? Almost certainly. And for at a personal level, if you really wanted to know, you could get a serology assay done where you have your blood drawn and they actually will measure how, what your level of antibodies are. Most people are having some of the highest titers that we've ever seen. I, I've never seen titers like this before. They're off the charts. I mean, I think that's why this thing is so effective. So they could fall a long, long way before it would even be questionable whether or not you had lost immunity. And so I think what we're all curious to see is how long, if you have these atmospheric, I mean, you know, stratospheric uh, levels of antibody, how long does it take for it actually to fall back to a level where it's no longer protective? And even then, remember, that's only the so-called humoral or B cell side of your immunity, you know, the side that makes antibodies. Uh, you still got the other T cell side, you know, that's forever. And we, no one knows how effective that's gonna be. Um, but, you know, the history of vaccines are that most people, you know, end up, you know, needing a booster or another vaccination. But there are many examples where you don't, or it takes 10 years before you need a booster shot. What we'd all like to know, so I'd like to know, is where does this uh, vaccine stand? Is it going to be the every year like influenza, which, by the way, doesn't work that well? Is it going to be more like tetanus every 10 years? Or is it going to be like, you know, some of these, you know, like, herpes, which can be you know, decades, for example. So, you know, personally, I have a strong suspicion that based on what happened with the original SARS patients, because they're so closely related, I'm a little bit optimistic, at least, that we may have very, very durable immunity against this virus. I'm hoping anyway, because you can argue, why should we be any different than the original SARS patients? But, you know, that's just a hunch and a hope. I can't guarantee it. What about the flip side? Um, someone has one dose of, in this case, AstraZeneca, and is looking to travel to Africa in two weeks. Mm -hmm. you uh, You're going to have a little less absolute probability of, uh, first of all, you better be at least two to three weeks out from your shot. <laughs> uh, and secondly, if it's AstraZeneca, um, boy, <laughs> that's a good one. AstraZeneca has not been as effective against some of the variants for whatever reason. And it's simple observation here. There's, there's two classes of vaccines running around, well, two broad classes, it's actually multiple classes, but the two important ones are the old and the new. The new are Moderna and Pfizer. It's completely new technology, never been used before, and it's knocked, you know, it's knocked the ball out of the park. It's extraordinary, no one ever imagined it would work this well because it's a completely different way of doing it. J&J, &J, AstraZeneca, and all the other virus uh, vaccines out there are older technology and it's well known that none of them achieve 95% protection in the first place, whether you get one or two doses. So safe is a relative term. Um, <clears throat> you're, you're not gonna get 95% protection, uh, but you're going to get probably a minimum of 75% protection, more like 80, 85%. Um, and again, remember, I said that even with 95% protection, the incidence of serious infections is incredibly low, okay? So I would say for an AstraZeneca vaccinated person, the probability of developing any sort of serious disease is extremely low, but the, the probability that you would never under any circumstances develop any form of viral infection, asymptomatic or mild COVID is less because of the known lesser effectiveness of the AstraZeneca vaccine compared to certainly Pfizer and Moderna. So, one traveler is asking, you know, is it crazy for a vaccinated traveler to go on safari in Africa, Kenya, this summer? Um, and, you know, I mean, it sounds like what you're saying is really no reason not to go pretty soon. I mean, like if you were choosing, if you had to choose between going on a safari now or waiting until a year and a half from now, which would you choose? 
well, since I'm fully vaccinated, uh, and I was vaccinated uh, you know, like the end of December, beginning of January, because all healthcare professionals got vaccinated back then, I'd probably be more inclined to go now because I know I'm covered now. <laughs> so uh, I think honestly, um, you know, outside of South Africa, the African continent has been remarkably unaffected as far as we know. Again, we don't have the accurate reporting that you get in some other places. But, you know, I don't think there's much evidence of this virus ravaging the African continent, uh, other than South Africa, which was obviously an exception to the rule, but that's also the most densely populated area, uh, or one of the most densely populated. Uh, I think you know, when you're talking about, you know, East Africa, Kenya, you're talking about, you know, situations like we said earlier, as long as you're going to a reputable, you know, camp where the, you know, everyone's been tested, your, your risk is extraordinarily low. I would worry more about being stuck in the airport in Nairobi than I would be out on safari. I would, I would not worry about being on safari. And, and what about the flight to get there? Do you feel that flying, well, there's actually a flight nonstop from New York to Nairobi, yes. uh, which is good, that sounds good. But I mean, yeah. people had a choice between like flying via Europe hmm. or flying, I mean, I think it sounds like what you're saying is instead of flying via, you know, fly via Europe or fly via hmm. South Africa, or I mean, no, don't fly via South Africa. Yeah. yeah. How, how, how do you come up with the airline, yeah. you know, what's your airline advice for getting to faraway places? Yeah. So for example, if I were gonna go on such a trip, hypothetically, the first thing I'd do is look at the flights that are available and ask what the airports they go through. Second thing I would do is look up the then current data you know, from the CDC, for example, for the incidence of the virus in that country and also in that geographic area, because you can break it down into geographic areas in the larger countries like Joburg versus Cape Town, for example. And if, as I'm hearing, the incident even in Joburg now is plummeted to very low levels and they have all these safety precautions in place, I wouldn't have any trouble going to South Africa to go through the airport in Joburg and on up to Kenya. What I would have a problem with is vacationing in South Africa and hanging around Cape Town and seeing how things go. Not a good idea until we know more about how fast this thing is going away because we know there's been a bad variant, variant, there, variant there that has run through the population and caused massive problems for the healthcare system. Because the one scenario you absolutely want to avoid is being in an area where the health care system is under duress, right? Because if anything were to happen to you, whether it's COVID or other, you ain't getting in the hospital if they're already inundated with a thousand, you know, COVID patients. So I think, you know, just again, being prudent and logical, if there is a low incidence in the airports, you know, where you would transit through, wherever that may be, and you can, you know, for example, obviously not hang around in Nairobi, you know, in the city and in the airport, but get out of there and get into the countryside and get out, you know, on safari, your risk is extremely low. The, the problem with this virus is it's spread by person to person contact in densely populated areas. That's city. Get out of the cities and get into the countryside and you're going to be fine. And if you can limit your exposure when in the cities, you're, and you're, and also let's assume you're vaccinated your risk is so low to begin with, other than, as I said earlier, you don't want to be exposed to billions of viral particles in the breath of somebody who's in the, about to come down with florid COVID-19. You know, there's always a chance with profound exposure that your vaccine, your immunity could be overcome. It's extremely low, but you know, a prudent person, you avoid scenarios like that. Where do they occur? Big cities, densely populated areas. So get in, get out, and get out in safari, and you got essentially nothing to worry about. You mentioned the healthcare system in, in other countries. Um, one viewer asked, how do you um, check? She's curious in particular about France, but wondering more globally, what's the best way to check on the quality of a, a foreign country's healthcare system? I think you know, any first world country has you know, more than adequate means for supporting anybody with COVID-19 and most other, you know, obviously, emergent situation. So, you know, whether it's France, whether it's, you know, UK, um, you know, that's not really going to be a consideration. Joburg, you know, has pretty decent healthcare. South Africa you know, has very good healthcare, all things considered. Nigeria, Kenya, not so much, you know. Uh, many other countries in Africa, definitely not, right? So, you know, again, back to MedJet earlier in this discussion, a prudent person might very well want to have, you know, medjet or equivalent type coverage to get in and out if you needed to. 
But by the same token, bear in mind, if you were an extraordinarily unfortunate circumstance where you develop any form of life-threatening illness, whether it's COVID-19 or anything else, there's always a chance that you have to be stabilized before you can even be flown out. And stabilization almost inevitably means that you're going to have to get to a municipal area and get taken care of. Well, if that municipal area is currently in the midst of a horrible COVID pandemic, A, you're going to be exposed to an awful lot of COVID patients, not a good idea. And B, you're not going to get the attention you should get if they weren't overwhelmed with COVID patients, which is why I said earlier, I personally would not want to be counting on you know, such an area to take care of me in the event that I required urgent medical care. So Dr. Trish, in light of what you just said and, and the interacting with, in, with uh, local people in crowded cities and whatnot, what is your feeling on cruises? We have a question about the cruises that are going to Greece this summer, and then it was just announced that the uh, U.S. may be allowed to start cruises. Uh, most of the cruise lines are mandating that all passengers and crew be vaccinated, but the passengers are getting off at ports and interacting with locals. So mm -hmm. the question is, what is the level of risk that a passenger or even a crew member would pick up a variant um, and then possibly spread it on board? So this goes back to the early comment that if everybody involved is vaccinated and doesn't fall into one of those categories where, you know, they have, you know, autoimmune disease or they've been on chemo or some such thing, uh, where you, your immune system is not going to be able to put up much of a defense against the virus. If you're not in any of those categories, and you know, hopefully nobody on board is, um, then the risk is extraordinarily small. You know, but the trick here is everybody on board has to fall in that category. Because all you need is one person, you know, the typhoid Mary scenario, spewing virus for an entire trip. You know, if you get exposed to enough virus, I don't care how immune you are, you can overwhelm your immune system. <clears throat> and so, you know, the, the extraordinarily high levels, you know, not to digress, but, you know, there's been a study, a study showing that healthcare workers who've been vaccinated have a higher incidence of breakthrough than the population at large, it seems. Because the number for healthcare workers, I think, is 0.02% and it's 0.001% for the population at large. So, you know, your, your chances of you know, still very low, but it's probably 10 to 20 times more likely in healthcare workers. Why? Because they're exposed to these patients all day long, all the time. They're, you know, they're just getting bombarded with this virus. And so it's like a war, you know, it's, you, know you have your soldiers and the virus has its soldiers, if you will, and who's going to win? Well, with immunity, a vaccination, you're going to win unless, you know, you have overwhelming force on the other side. So in the case of, uh, you know, of a cruise ship, as long as you don't have somebody who's, quote, a super spreader capable person on board, I think there's essentially no risk. And even if you get off and get back on again, if you're vaccinated, you're not going to bring back any significant amount of virus, even if you're exposed, because the virus cannot succeed in infecting you. You could carry some, you know, you can carry virus in your hands, you can carry it in your nose. That's a, there's a difference between having it on your person and you having an infection. The difference is you can carry it from one person to another as a passive carrier, you know, but it's not until it starts duplicating itself in you that you have the disease and you become a source of new infection. So yeah, you could be handling stuff that has COVID virus on it. You could bring that on board. It's not going to last very long because it's got nobody to infect. Dr. Trish, we've had a number of questions about immunization rates in other countries, um, which I think similar to what you were just saying. Is that is that something that you would take into account, um, how widely a, a vaccine has been um, spread in, a, in, a, in your destination? Yeah. The um, single most important thing, though, is that you're vaccinated. <laughs> okay. um, but even beyond that, again, in some countries where vaccination rates are extremely low, like India, for example, you're seeing just massive levels of the infection. And there's this correlate between the severity of the disease and the number of viral particles you're exposed to to cause the disease in the first place. So in a population where you're seeing these tens of millions of copies of the virus in every little swab you know, that's taken, um, you know that the viral titers in those countries are through the roof and that increases your risk. And once vaccination starts having an effect in any given population, what we're seeing is a rapid level, the drop in the level of viral titers in the population. And it's simple because, you know, it's like, how much can you spread and how, 
how far can you spread and how many copies of yourself can you make? In a vaccinated, even a partially vaccinated population, it gets harder and harder for the virus to find a host. And so as such, it becomes less and less efficient and you know, the titers you know, get lower and lower. So I think uh, the simple answer is a country that has low incidence, low number, lesser percent of the population with active disease and has obviously a higher percent of that population with vaccination is the type of country you wanna to go to. What you don't wanna to go to is a country where there's an outbreak and a lot of severe disease uh, with a lot of hospitalizations and a relatively low vaccination rate because you know it's like a cesspool of virus there everywhere. And you know, why put yourself through that on the off chance that your immunity wasn't up to it? Uh, Dr. Trish, I think a lot of people are interested in going to Europe pretty pretty soon after it sort of opens up. You know, the EU announced that it will be opening to vaccinated uh, travelers this summer. And mm -hmm. I think there are a number of people who are thinking, okay, I want to get to France before it becomes overrun again. Right, right. <laughs> so they're thinking, okay, do I go in the fall or, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and I guess my question is, you know, you were also saying better to stay in the country than in big cities, mm -hmm. right? You, know, you right. want to avoid the population density. If you were going to Europe, mm -hmm. what would you, I don't know, what are some of the factors you'd look at? I know you've been talking about, you've just mentioned a lot of different factors, but right. what, are some, what are some of the things you think about in, in terms of, you know, where would you go in Europe? And I guess the single most, um, sure. Well, actually my wife and I have been debating whether to go to Italy this fall, just for openers in Sicily, uh, <clears throat> and we might do it. <clears throat> We're seriously considering it. Um, <clears throat> we, um, one of the things I think is important is that it's not only where you go, it's what you do when you get there. And, you know, personally these days, I feel it's like, you know, drive down the street in any large city in America right now, you see the sidewalks full of people eating outside, you know, and th that's the main thing. If you can, you know, you can go pretty much any place you want in Europe, I think, uh, at this point when you're vaccinated, and the only caveat would be try to avoid those densely, you know, populated areas with prolonged exposure indoors, you know. Beyond that, I'm not terribly worried, to be honest, you know, I think, you um, the, the incidence of infection outside is so low, it's ridiculous. Remember, this thing really got going in the winter when everybody was inside, ski lodges, things like that, right? So <clears throat> most ski lodges are not relevant during the summer, right? <clears throat> and their most activities tend to occur outside during the summer. So I think um, going pretty much any place you want to in Europe, where hopefully you're gonna spend most of your time doing fun things you know, outside, riding bikes, hiking, going to see the sights, what have you, eating outside on the sidewalk, you know, and, you know, maybe going to see a museum, but, you know, hopefully not when it's packed with a gazillion people, because it won't be, because I'll bet you the guidelines are going to limit, you know, admission to a lot of these events to avoid the dense packing of people. But even if they don't, I personally would not go to an event that was densely packed. I would just say a prudent person avoids the high risk areas just in case. So you may be going to, oh, sorry. Go ahead. I'm just curious, you may be going to Italy um, or maybe even Sicily. Yes, uh, we, I, we, uh, we were in the middle of a trip to Sicily where I had a meeting uh, a couple of years ago, three years ago, I guess it was, four years ago. Um, and it got interrupted because we, had, we were called home suddenly and we've always have felt nuts. We never finished uh, the trip and I really wanted to do that. And on top of that, you know, we've, we've lived in Italy. Uh, we lived there for over a year or a better part of a year. And uh, I go there, have gone there many, many times. Uh, and, you know, we love Italy. It's just one of the countries that we particularly enjoy. We like exploring it. So we got thinking, okay, when we get out of jail from COVID, where would we go? Our first choice would happen, would happen to be Italy. And what we would probably do is <clears throat> rent a car in Rome, for example, and tour and go see small villages and you know maybe work our way across uh, the straits and get down into Sicily or some such thing. Those are sort of at least the, the fantasies that we have. So yeah, that's what uh, we've been thinking about. <laughs> I, th I think a lot of other people have the same fantasy. Yes. Uh, and you would fly from what? Fly from Los Angeles to Rome on a nonstop? Mm -hmm. Is that the idea? And then, yeah. uh-huh. Yeah. 
Well, yeah. in our case, unfortunately, West Coast oftentimes is actually easier to quickly hit Dulles on your way through. And, you know, Dulles is a very safe airport, obviously, <clears throat> for many reasons, <clears throat> and then probably continue the flight over. Sometimes we would do a, a nonstop, but it's a pretty long flight from LA, you know, just to, you know, it's nice to take a break after uh, like a five hour leg and then do like what, a six, seven hour leg. So um, we, um, but that's, you know, we'd probably fly, fly into Rome. That's the easiest place and, you know, take off from there. Yeah, I would have no qualms about doing that. That's that's very interesting. A lot of people will enjoy hearing that. <laughs> yeah, no, I think you know I feel a lot better about that because you know, remember we we know that uh, first of all there's high quality medical care. Second, we know precautions are in place, and thirdly, we know that you know the outbreaks you know that keep popping up and so forth are being rapidly responded to. I mean, you know, it's clear. You know, for example, Germany has had its uptick. Heaven only knows why. <clears throat> I think a lot of it has to do with fatigue and people just got tired of following the guidelines of not packing themselves together and so forth. So sure, they got another uptick, but you know, on the relative scale of things, <laughs> almost any place in Europe right now is a lot safer than some of the areas that we've talked about earlier, where it's just a different order of magnitude, you know, India, Brazil, and at least previously South Africa. Um, so you just wanna, you know, when you're planning a trip, in my opinion, you just wanna look and see is there any evidence of an uptick and a potential real surge in infections in the destination where I want to go? And if there's no such evidence, you know, I would say, hey, what are we worried about? And then you say, well, what happens if after you get there, there's an uptick? Well, you can always fly home early, can't you? <laughs> so I think, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's a calculated risk like everything in life. But, you know, the, the risk for places like Europe, I think, is much lower than some of the other possibilities. Well, we, we've kept you for an hour. Um, your advice has been just fascinating. Uh, thank you so much for spending this time with us. We really, really appreciate it, Dr. Trish. It's been my pleasure. I think these are good questions, by the way, and I hope that the answers have maybe reassured people. I guess if there's one thought I would sort of leave everybody with is that, you know, when you step back from all the details, you've actually, for most of the people anyway on this call, I assume, you've actually got the greatest gift of all you got vaccinated and you know most of the world has not been and i think we are all very very lucky uh, in the countries where vi vaccination has been widespread because that is probably the single most important factor in everything we've been talking about just think if you weren't vaccinated how comfortable you would feel about doing any of this right not very comfortable so i mean my comment would be is if you're not vaccinated get vaccinated for heaven's sakes there's no reason not to <laughs> great, great advice. And I, Dr. Trish, I sure hope you make it to Italy and Sicily. <laughs> yeah. uh, you deserve a break after all of this. So it's well, been a long haul. <laughs> <laughs> well, it would be a pleasure. I'm hoping we can pull it off. There's so many things going on. And, you know, it's, I've, uh, I've told many people the problem with COVID is not that anything got any easier staying at home. All that happened is I discovered I had two jobs instead of one. So if I can ever figure out how to get out of at least one of those jobs, <clears throat> like COVID testing to be exact, then maybe one of these days I can go on a trip. I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, good. Well, have a wonderful trip. And thank you again so much for You're spending this time with us and, and, and enlightening us all to such a degree. We really appreciate it. It's my pleasure. I hope it's been helpful. Thank you. It's been very helpful. Thank you so much. <laughs> You're welcome. And, and thank you to all of our all of our viewers today. And we'll be back tomorrow uh, at six o'clock Eastern for a talk about airline travel and uh, how to be the get the the you know best airline experience you can during COVID. So thanks again, everybody. See you tomorrow. Thank you, Dr. Thank Trish. You. Bye bye.